everyone, I'm Emily from Grad Student Finances. Today we're discussing the different types of pay you might receive as a graduate student, how you can tell what type of pay you're receiving, and why it matters. For your role as a graduate student, you may receive a stipend as well as scholarships. When I say stipend, I'm referring to what is essentially your take-home pay for your living expenses. When I say scholarship, I'm referring to money that is earmarked to pay education expenses, like your tuition. This type of pay may not actually go to your bank account, but rather may be posted to your bursar account, cashier's account, or whatever university account handles student fees. There are two main reasons that grad students receive stipends. The first is because they are serving as a research assistant or teaching assistant. The second is because they are receiving a fellowship. The fellowship might be issued by the university, the department, or an outside funding agency. If you're receiving a stipend because you are serving as an RA or TA, you are receiving compensatory pay. You are doing a job and being paid for it. If you're receiving a stipend because you have won a fellowship, you are receiving non-compensatory pay. You have won an award and there is officially no work requirement tied to receiving this award. Of course, we all know that's nonsense, but that's how the IRS and the universities have chosen to classify fellowships. Scholarships are also a form of non-compensatory pay. Again, you're being given an award, not working in order to receive the scholarship. These designations may seem rather arbitrary, and it is sometimes difficult to tell exactly why one is receiving a stipend. Grad students who are receiving fellowships may have the same day-to-day -day work as students who are RAs or TAs. The definitive way to tell which category you fall into is by what kind of tax documentation you receive in January. If you're receiving compensatory pay, you will be issued a W-2 at tax time. If you receive any other kind of documentation or no documentation at tax time, that is indicative that you may have received non-compensatory pay. Exactly what kind of documentation is issued for non-compensatory pay varies by university. You may receive a 1099 miscellaneous with box 3 income listed. This is likely going to reflect your fellowship pay and most often is issued because you have had taxes withheld from your paychecks. You may receive a 1098-T. Some universities use the 1098-T to document fellowships, some use it to document scholarships, and some use it to document both. You may receive a courtesy letter, which is basically an informal letter that tells you the amount of fellowship pay you received in the course of the year. You may also receive no documentation whatsoever for your fellowship or scholarships. This is the most confusing case for graduate students and may cause them to think they have less tax liability than is truly the case. For this reason, all grad students should check on whether they had any fellowship or scholarship pay in the course of the year, instead of assuming that they did not. Fellowship pay, again, is likely going to be the pay you used for your living expenses, while scholarships will be posted to your bursar or cashier's account. Please note that in a given calendar year, you may receive one, two, or all three of the above types of pay, and may receive multiple forms of documentation for your non-compensatory pay. Why does it matter whether students receive compensatory or non-compensatory pay? There are a few situations in which the distinction matters quite a bit, although they are not necessarily common. First, the kind of pay you receive determines whether or not you can contribute to tax-advantaged retirement accounts. As virtually no universities allow students to contribute to the University 403B, it is often the case that the only tax-advantaged retirement account option available to graduate students is an Individual Retirement Arrangement, or IRA. However, only grad students who receive compensatory pay are eligible to contribute to IRAs. This means that to contribute to an IRA from your grad student income, that income must be reported on a W-2 at tax time. You can read more about this in IRS Publication 590, Chapter 1 and IRS Publication 970, Chapter 1. Second, the kind of pay you receive matters for your income taxes in some cases. Both compensatory and non-compensatory pay can end up as part of your total taxable income for the year, so that is not where the differences lie. The first difference is in whether or not you can have taxes withheld from your stipend. You should be able to have taxes withheld from your compensatory pay. Some universities and departments allow you to set up tax withholding on your non-compensatory pay, while others do not. However, you may still be responsible for paying taxes to the IRS throughout the year. Grad students who do not have taxes withheld need to check if they are required to pay quarterly estimated tax. You can read more about this in IRS Publication 505. The second difference is in the total amount of deductions you can take for your qualified education expenses. You can deduct all of your qualified education expenses against your non-compensatory pay. 
If your qualified education expenses exceed your non-compensatory pay, you will have to use the lifetime learning credit, the tuition and fees deduction, or another credit or deduction to reduce the tax burden on your compensatory pay. These other deductions and credits have limits. You can read more about this in IRS Publication 970, Chapters 1, 3, and 6. Third, the kind of pay you receive matters to your classification in the eyes of the university. If you are enrolled as a graduate student, you have a student status at the university. If you receive only non-compensatory pay, your student status is your only status. If you receive compensatory pay, in a sense, you have both a student status and an employee status. If you are a full-time student, your primary relationship with the university is likely that of a student instead of an employee, but your secondary status as an employee may come into play in rare instances. The benefits that students receiving compensatory and non-compensatory pay are eligible for may be different. Possible differences could include health, vision, or dental insurance, vacation and leave policies, childcare subsidies, union membership, and other benefits. Most of the time, full-time graduate students do not have to pay FICA taxes while they're in school. Non-compensatory pay students are not receiving wages, so FICA taxes do not apply. Compensatory pay students are receiving wages, but are eligible for a FICA exemption if they and the institution meet certain qualifications. These qualifications may not be met year-round for compensatory pay students at certain universities. In some cases, students receiving compensatory pay have a predominantly student status during the school year, but a predominantly employee status during the summer, so the FICA exemption may not apply in the summer. Similarly, if students receiving compensatory pay are considered predominantly employees at some points throughout the year, they may be eligible for or mandated to contribute to the university's retirement plan. At public universities in certain states, compensatory pay students must automatically contribute to the state employee pension plan when they are considered predominantly employees. Thank you for watching this video and I hope you found it clarifying. If you have anything to add about the types of graduate student pay and their implications, or you would like to tell me how compensatory and non-compensatory pay are handled at your university, please leave a comment or email me at emily at gradstudentfinances.org. I would also love if you would ask me any questions you have about personal finance for graduate students. See you next time.